Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. This looks like a great turnout. Um, what we're going to do over the next hour is what we're referring to as an expert forum, where we are trying to take on some of the difficult problems surrounding uh, research questions uh, about marine energy interactions. And not a surprise to anyone, I don't think, that the risk of collision between marine animals and turbines is a major factor that is slowing down siting and permitting of these um, devices. Um, we're very fortunate to have uh, Carol Sparling with SMRU Marine leading this forum today. And I'm just going to back out of the way and let Carol take over here. Uh, I might suggest that with this number of people online, maybe it would be a good idea for people to do a quick introduction, just tell us who's on the line and who they are before Carol takes over. Uh, here in Seattle, we have Andrea Copping, Luke Hanna, Mark, uh, J uh, John Whiting, and uh, Nikki Sather. So why don't you go ahead, the rest of you. Okay. I'll, I'll start. So here in St. Andrews, um, Carol Sparling and Rachel Plunkett, who's one of our project scientists, she's joined us for the for the next hour. Got Angus Cook from the British Trust for Ornithology. There's John Horn and Benjamin Williamson, and we're also sitting in Seattle at the University of Washington. Hi, this is uh, Chris Tomachek. I'm uh, with Collinger Associates. I'm on the East Coast, uh, we've done a lot of work with the uh, bird in the East River, and we're trying to develop uh, a strike model. It's uh, Ian Hutchison here and Jude Hamilton from Aquaterra in Orkney in Scotland. And uh, Bob Batty and Stephen Benjamins from Sam's in Oban. Got uh, Ben Wilson from the University of the Highlands and Islands and Sam's in Inverness slash Oban. Ross Gardner, uh, Marine Scotland, uh, work on work on salmon. Liz Nasdaq, ERI, up in Thurso, across the water from Orkney. This is uh, Gail Zedleski at the University of Maine, and I have um, Haiju Shen and Garrett Staines, and we've been working in um, eastern Maine on um, the Ocean Renewable Power Company turbine. Okay, well. Uh, Carol, why don't you go ahead? Um, uh, and I would suggest that Carol's going to going to provide a few slides and then really lead this discussion. And especially because there are so many of us on the line, if you don't mind announcing who you are when you speak, that would be really helpful. Thanks very much. Go ahead, Carol. Okay, thanks very much, Andrea, um, and thanks for for asking me to get involved with the Annex Four Expert Forums. Um, this sort of led out of a discussions that I've been having with various people in the UK and, and then those discussions continued in my recent visit to Canada um, as part of the, the ICOE conference. Um, so I'm really pleased to get a chance to, to bring this group together to discuss these issues. Um, I think the idea that this will be the, depending on how today goes, this will be the first and perhaps what we see is a series of four um, similar events, all focusing on one aspect of this, this area, so the risk of collision between marine animals and tidal turbines. Um, I've only got a few slides. I won't talk for very long because I want to get the most out of this hour in terms of discussion and to get everyone's ideas and, um, and to, get, yeah, to get everyone's thoughts. So I'm just going to run through a few slides that kind of set up what I'm hoping to get out of, of these in general and then in today, uh, out of today in particular. Um, so as, as Andrea said, that the, the risk of, of Marine animals, and apologise, this slide is very marine mammal specific, um, but I'm sure some of the some of the principles are, are equal to all taxa. Um, but collision risk is is, is, a, is up there with one of the biggest kind of issues. Certainly in the UK, it's one of the, the sort of biggest consenting issues, and it is causing a big barrier to how many projects we can actually get developed, and it's a big issue in the tidal industry. Um, so everyone's been thinking quite hard about how not only how we predict the the potential for collision when a new project comes online, but sort of laterally more thinking about how we collect the data when projects actually do start operating that might feed back in to refine those predictions and how we can actually kind of close this loop and get and get to, to, to where we need to be. Um, so this, this is just a generalized framework that we've been kind of thinking about. Um, and don't worry too much about the details of this, but it was just to say that when we started thinking about how 
the prediction of collision and the, the, the collection of data and the consenting issue and that, that whole feedback loop fit together, there was a number of kind of elements of that, of this whole um, framework, if you like, that were kind of coming out. Um, and so I'm not going to dwell on this, but basically if we just look at the left-hand side of this, there are kind of two main features feeding into the sort of a prediction of the number of collisions that might be taking place. And that's what I've called here the encounter probability, so the probability of an animal being in the same space and time as a rotating turbine blade. And then the one below that is the strike probability. probability. So given that account encounter has taken place, what's the probability of an actual strike, an actual collision taking place? Um, and I realize that a number of things kind of feed into both of those um, things related to animal behavior, things related to animal behavior, but also the physical characteristics um, of, the, of the turbine itself and the animal characteristics. And th this led to kind of discussions about, about definitions. And that's kind of what I want to focus today on, is definitions of terms within this framework um, and whether or not as a community, across various tax of birds, fish, and marine mammals, whether we can agree um, or need to disagree um, on what those def what definitions of a number of terms might be. And what I mean, the kind of terms I'm thinking about are what's avoidance, what's evasion, what scales are those operating, operating at, and how do we define those scales? Um, but also things as simple as what is an encounter? How do we define an encounter? And I know various definitions have been used and, and are around, but I'm aware that we're not always using these, these terms in the same way. Um, and then in, so hopefully, and I'll come back to this, um, hopefully in later discussions we'll get more of a, we'll focus more on some of these other areas. So um, I'll just move on to the next slide for now. Okay, so this, as I said, this is the first in a series of four online discussions covering a range of topics. So this one I want to focus on definitions. And so tentative ideas, and these are all open to discussion, for subsequent discussions are one topic that um, has, been, has come to the forefront in a lot of discussions, but refining predictions in terms of understanding or predicting what the consequences might be for, for individuals, i.e. not all strikes are considered equal. And at the moment, consenting is on the basis of each collision leads to mortality and that animal is then removed from the population. But I think we're all agreed that, well, for marine mammals at least, that that's not necessarily the case. So um, I thought it'd be useful to have a whole hour dedicated to discussing that topic. Thirdly, um, in terms of predicting and understanding risk and actually monitoring risk, um, how can we incorporate measures of realistic animal residence, behavior, and movement through these tidal areas into our predictive models. And then considering that feedback, how should we be going out and collecting data to inform that risk? Not only during operational, um, when we've got devices operating, but also in a baseline scenario. If we want to go out and, and characterize a site before anything goes in, what are the sorts of metrics that we want to be measuring um, to be able to predict what the risk might be? And then the fourth one I've left fairly open for now, and we can either see what emerges throughout this process, provide an overview of where we've got to with the first three, or use it to fill in any sort of burning issues that have come to the fore that haven't been addressed in, in any of the other three. And as I said, these are all kind of open, open for a bit of discussion. So to focus on today's, um, I, I was going back to what I said at the start, I want to have a discussion around definitions. Um, and the first, the first concept is really how an animal can avoid or evade a collision and how that might be related to the scale from the device. So I've just put up a number of terms that I know are in use at the moment. So in the very um, near, near field, close to the device, we have um, terms such as evasion, near field avoidance, oh, and I've actually, sorry, apologies, I've got those two the wrong way around. Micro avoidance should be on the left hand side there. And then the further away we get from a device using terms like avoidance, far field avoidance, and macro avoidance. Um, so the question is kind of, to me, spring to mind about where, where do we, how do we define where one changes into the other for the different um, types of animals? Are they, this, are they likely to be the same all, across all animals? Um, and, and are those, 
can we kind of decide on a consistent set of terminology that we're all happy with? Or is there is there kind of um, other contentions there that we might have to deal with? And then a number of other things I think it'd be worth defining or having a discussion, a discussion about defining. Um, what Simply, what is a strike? Um, what do we mean when we, we say a strike? Are we all thinking along the same lines? What is an encounter? How do we define that? Um, sorry, four is a repeat of the, the second one there. Um, these slides were put together quite quickly, as you can probably tell. And then the fifth one, when is an animal actually considered at risk? Is it the same as a, a, an encounter definition, or do we think that there's a wider risk envelope that animals could potentially be drawn in towards, towards a collision? And I'm aware that we've probably all been thinking about these things and discussing these things um, probably independently or in small groups. So I welcome the chance to get a group of biologists across the, the piece working on different groups of animals together to, to have a discussion about this. Um, and so sort of further questions that we can consider or might come up in the discussion are, can we be consistent across taxa? So fish and marine mammals, can we use the same terms? Can we agree on the same terms? What have we got? What can we learn from the bird and wind farm community? Um, bird biologists, bird um, issues have been raised for a long time with, the, with onshore wind, wind farms and now moving offshore. So are there are there lessons learned there about these definitions and terminologies that we can gain from at the stage that we are at? And then finally, I'm not sure we'll get a chance to get as far as this, but if we can define these things and agree on these things, what are the best techniques for then going out and measuring them? So measuring an encounter, measuring a strike, and measuring different scales of avoidance, and what are the limitations? And is there a feedback there? Do our definitions have to take into account the limitations of measuring? So are we already constrained there when it comes to our definitions? Um, so I think that's probably, I've done enough talking for now. So I'm going to open that up to the floor, but I'm going to go back to, I think, my first definition slide and suggest that we start here in terms of the, the description of an animal's ability to avoid a collision in relation to scale. Um, and I don't know if anyone wants to jump in, has any kind of burning desire to, to start this discussion off, or I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking for Okay, right. Bob Barty and Stephen Benjamins here in, in Oban. Um, can I start by first of all confessing that it's all my fault for <laughs> having this whole division or into evasion and avoidance. I started it by coming from the field of predator-prey interaction between you know, animals and their predators and evading or avoiding predator attack. And um, what I meant by evasion and, and avoidance was not just, not really in terms of distance uh, from a device, from going from the near field to the far field, but distance in terms of the scale of the animal and its behavior. So it would vary between animals. Um, but essentially, there would be a, a scale effect dependent on the size of the animal. So it might be a simple way that you could perhaps develop some sort of rule of thumb that was based upon body length or distance in body length, for example. Well, Any we, response to that? <laughs> sorry, we, we've just been dealing with exactly this issue in relation to offshore wind farms and birds. and the, one of the big problems we found was that everyone was talking about avoidance, but no one was actually saying what they meant by avoidance. So in our, our sort of review, we've chalked it up and we've said, well, if there's an a response outside the wind farm, then we're going to call that macro avoidance. If there's a response within the wind farm, we're going to complicate matters and introduce a third category called meso response. And then we'll have a, this this final category, which is just this last second um, behaviour to avoid a collision, which we'll call a macro avoidance. So we were sort of we were sort of recognising that the whole whole thing's a continuum and it's all avoidance, but you've got to sort of chop it up at the for for the ease of measuring it and quantifying it, you've got to chop it up at the different levels that people collect the data at. I would argue that it's not really a continuum, continuum um, but it's dependent on two different sorts of behavior, that ev evasion is avoiding at close range a collision and involves a very rapid response by the animal, 
that then um, results in them swimming at their absolute maximum speed to get away from this collision or the predator's mouth when it's a predator attack. Whereas avoidance is taken at much greater distance using different sensory input probably um, to avoid any kind of interaction, any, any, any counter at all. And the two behaviours are completely different. So, so could you agree there that, that then at least avoidance could be a continuum? Evasion and avoidance are very distinct. So to yes, use Angus's yes. parallel, micro-avoidance is, is equivalent to evasion and meso and macro avoidance are a continuum just dependent on relation to a collection of, of turbines versus actually being inside that. I guess there's not there's not a straight parallel for tidal de devices because we're not at the stage of arrays yet. So if we were to bring that bird parallel into tidal domains, we would be talking about once we built up into arrays of turbines that we would be calling macro avoidance avoidance of the whole array, um, potentially meso avoidance, still avoiding the whole swept sphere and not coming into risk of coming into direct contact, um, and then micro avoidance being that last evasion, that last kind of real quick jerk out of the way. Does that make sense? Uh, it, makes, it makes sense to me, but I would still argue that it's better to use a different word to describe the the micro evasion, that's a, a micro avoidance. It really should be called evasion because it, it depends on different behavioral processes and most likely on different sensory input, different sensory cues. I want to jump in here just real quick because I think the conversation is good. The concept of there are things operating on different scales is correct. But what you just said actually sort of gets to the, 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 the crux of the thing, which is you will have different types of behaviors depending on what the information is that the animals are getting to respond to. So far field avoidance may be a result of sound or who knows, you know, any, any number of, of cues that, that indicate to the animal that they want to stay away from that area. Um, however, once they start getting into where they can detect the hydraulic signals of these structures, I would expect the behavior to change rather rapidly. And then, and then as you get even closer, you have vision that might become a dominant uh, modality that they're going to respond to. So I would actually, you know, I think the idea of thinking these as continuums is good. I don't think it's an important thing to worry about whether we talk about evasion or avoidance, so long as you're specific about the zone within which you're operating and the scale on what you're talking about. So that idea of, a, of avoiding a, an imminent strike as opposed to, um, and frankly one of my concerns of this whole technology is uh, organisms that are attracted to these structures and are holding station near them, they may still be avoiding them from quite close but not doing a startle response as was just suggested. That, you know, there, there are other ways that they can avoid them and you know, the work that we did sort of showed that there is a near field avoidance that happens that is not a startle type response. Yeah, I, th I think that's good. I, I also, I agree. I don't think what what we call them is necessarily that important, but I think it's important at this stage, based on our experiences in the wind industry, to sort of get get these definitions nailed down at a fairly early stage because it'll make things a lot easier moving forward. Is there a feel for how um, consistent we might? want to be or, or can we be between different types of animals so between birds fish and marine mammals or um i'm not suggesting that the, the, the scales the boundaries of scale will be the same and um, far from it but the, the terminology is like can we agree that um, well firstly can we agree given the discussion to date that evasion um might be the term that we prefer for that real um that real, if the animal didn't otherwise react, it would have resulted in a strike. Is there any? But that's almost maybe that should be escape. Escape. <laughs> it's closer to an escape response, which you're describing there. <clears throat> and th again, that's why I actually like the idea that avoid. You know, English is good. Avoidance is a general term. I don't think we need to be too specific. I, I, I would prefer to make it specific with explicit language, you know, type 1, type 2, type 3, and here's what we mean by those types, um, you know, and, and then you have fixed definitions that, you know, don't, don't get us too deep into jargon. 
So that's that's similar to the to the bird definitions of macro, micro, meso, but just that those definitions themselves are, are somewhat descriptive. But they're they're further defined defined as Angus said by in relation to where where the response is actually ha manifested. Right, because that ultimately is what we're going to care about, and 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 my my point is just to make the term as clear and frankly, micro, meso, macro, that works for me. Uh, ben Wilson here. I wonder if I can say um, I, th I think there's interesting aspects to this in terms of range, and I think another another uh, list to think about would be uh, animals reacting to part of a device. So, like a blade that's close to them, to the whole device. So, you're interested in the, the whole turbine, and then interested in, in uh, an array of turbines. So, so again, there's another an axis there, where evasion you'd expect it to be an animal dodging around part of a device, and, and that part is quite important relative to other parts and relative to the scale of the response the animal's got, in the sense it might just take itself into another part of the, or another rotor, all the way through to avoiding a, a whole farm of devices with multiple devices where they're, where they're all acting um, to provide the stimulus. So there's another aspect depending on, on, on the gear. Over. Sorry, Angus again. I, I think that that was something that we tried to, when we were working with the wind farm example, that was something we were trying to take account of because, as you say, animals might be attracted to specific parts of the um, underwater turbine, but the, there's the same case with uh, birds and wind farms. Birds are attracted to specific parts of the turbines, like the bases, because they offer a, a potential roost. So we, so that's that's why we had this distinction between. Uh, micro avoidance and the meso avoidance. So the micro avoidance was specifically a response to the blades rather than the turbine. Can I just um, ask a question, probably um, possibly to directed at you, Bob, because I'm, I'm thinking about people who have actually, you know, built predictive models, um, and to what extent? Does it really matter in terms of building the predictions how how we def how we define these and how how we we differentiate between them? Because I'm thinking in terms of attraction, if we had a, a sort of an evasion versus avoidance term, an attraction would be a positive value, or a, depending how the model was set up, in the the sort of overall avoidance, in that it would increase the likelihood of an encounter taking place. Um, so is that is that important from that context? Whereas if we're if the attraction is to another part of the device, so it's the, the base, for example, we could be collecting data on on animals being more likely to be around a device, so we'd call that attraction, but it isn't actually going to increase their risk because they're not coming close to the to the actual moving parts. I'm just wondering how we get a handle on that in, in the modeling sense in a predictive way. I want to jump in again, if I can, Ted Castro Santos. So I've done a lot of work looking at time to event um, frameworks for for very similar stuff with respect to passing fish at fish ladders. But it's the same problem that we're talking about, and I I think it's actually wrong to separate these things out. What you have are rates of movement, and you can have rates of movement um, out of a given zone and into a given zone. And the longer they're in the zone, the more likely it is that they arrive at the next zone in, essentially. And so very similar to what you're saying with your attraction is that the longer they're present, and you can think of that as retention also, right? So attraction moves them in. Retention holds them there. And the more time they spend near there, you, you, you asserted that they were not approaching a blade. Well, the longer they're present, the more likely it is that they will approach that blade and have that encounter. And so what ends up, what, the, the way this ends up being modeled is you have this instantaneous risk of strike, and then you have instantaneous rates of movement in and out of the system so that as you move towards strike, your, you know, the probability of strike goes up. But it, but it accumulates over time. So if you're only there very, very briefly, you may have a very low probability of strike. But the longer you're there, the, the more likely that becomes. So it's, time, it's a time-based rate function, not a binomial response. 
Okay. Okay, if I may jump in. Um, I would suggest that avoidance and attraction and the amount of time spent in an area, if the animals can actually swim against the tidal stream uh, and maintain position when an arg and ar argue that particularly for smaller marine mammals and for fish that they won't be able to do that, but that's an aside really, that all that matters is the density of the animals at the depths that and location of the turbine. So if avoidance reduces that, you get a, it, 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 or attraction increases that, that's, that's fine. But the only thing that you can apply to an, any encounter rate is, is the probability of evasion. That if, if they actually are going to occupy the same space in time, at the same time as the blade, then there is likely to be a collision and they have to evade. But avoidance simply and attraction simply alter the density at that point. So we need two stages to the model, one to calculate the effective density of the animals and one then to calculate the counter rate, and sorry, and a third one to calculate the probability of evasion, which can be done, or could be done, I should say. So there's, a, there's an implicit um, definition of encounter itself there in that it's the, the animal and the turbine blade occupying the same space and time. Well, the animal being on a course to occupy that same space. Okay, is that is there general? On that, of course, you can only work out from um, what's known about the swimming orientation of the animal or assuming that it's random and the pattern of movement of the blade. Yep, so not so just... If, if they didn't take it, you would get so many animals that would occupy the same space if they are passive particles in the water that are not behaving and responding. Carol, this is John in Seattle, and I have a, a question for the intent and, and partly to the group because I, I'm seeing two, or I'm hearing two different lines of, of conversation. Um, some of it is process driven and looking towards a modeling outcome to clarify the definitions on how you get to the mechanisms. That would be a, a modeling exercise. And secondly, for the definitions, I see it from the potential of a regulatory perspective in this becomes more of a pattern description where you may have uh, the zones, regions, those terms were used implying a range from a device. Do you see these two? ultimately being at the same place, or should they be examined separately so that if there are differences in intent, um, those could also become explicit? Because I, I think the, the paths are crossing, and for a discussion that's fine, but I'm not quite sure if you have a specific goal for the outcome of this conversation. Okay, can, can I ask you just to, to clarify what your second um, secondary was? I don't think I quite caught it from a more regulatory perspective. If we start defining near and far field evasion and avoidance, you could do that in terms of range from a device. And, and the terms of regions or zones have also been used in the conversation this morning. Those typically are a pattern description as opposed to more of a, a, a why those events occur, the process driven. Do you see these as two separate conversations? If so, I'm thinking that these terms need to be made explicit <clears throat> in the context of which they're being made so that we can see if, if the modeling needs and the regulatory needs are met at the same time or there has to be a, 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 hopefully not two sets of terms but at least a, a translation. Yeah. Okay. I think I, I think I get you. I'm not. I'm not convinced of the need for the, the sort of more pattern description-driven um, definitions. I think where where I was coming from with with the idea behind sort of bringing this group together for a discussion um, was probably not quite as not massively tightly defined, but it was certainly more around the process, more from the point of view of of developing predictive models or. or um, refining predictive models and um, sort of driving data collection. So understanding what we were actually going out to measure and what the, the metrics of some of these field studies might, some of the end 
desired point of some of these field studies might be in terms of feeding it back in. I know um, I've written, I've heard, I've read a lot of things about that avoidance rates are what we really need to understand what the risk of collision is. So it's about being able to predict, but it's how do we go out? What do we go out and measure? Um, so is it do we want to measure avoidance? Um, do we want to measure evasion? How do we measure those things? Do we need to tackle those things differently? And do, do those things explicitly need to be built into models differently? Does it, does it matter for the, for the process modeling, I think? OK, thanks for the, the, the clarification. Um, the initial text that I read suggested uh, for a regulatory application and not as much emphasis on the process modeling. I think I think when um, we're talking about regulatory application, it's more about the the predictive side of things. So, being able to make regulatory decisions about um, projects going forward and adaptive management of projects from that side of things, so that the regulatory input there, rather than necessarily defining zones um, around around devices, if that makes sense. Yes, that helps in my thinking. Thank you. Okay. The, I think we're, there's consensus on the, the sort of need for a distinction between evasion and avoidance. Um, there have been three different suggestions for, for how we define those. There was a starting point with evasion versus avoidance. There's Angus's micro avoidance versus the other scales of avoidance. And there was a, a type one, type two, type three. Um, does anyone have a, an additional suggestion, or do, should we? Can we agree that they're, they're, it doesn't matter what we use as long as at the time we're defining them? Are we all happy to to, to, to go away from this conversation and start calling calling evasion calling it evasion versus avoidance? Is that, or, or or is that not really something that that people are that worried about? Well, I'm happy with evasion versus avoidance, but I think it would be important to divide up avoidance into different scales at which it is occurring. Um, but retaining the clear distinction between evasion, which essentially in, um, initiates an escape response, and avoidance, which uh, leads to other sorts of behaviour. I think that makes sense. Okay, anyone else? I kind of agree, this has been here, I agree with, with Bob's last or penultimate point there that it might be worth breaking up avoidance along the lines of some of the bird discussions because there's a difference in avoiding one turbine as opposed to avoiding a whole farm of, or array of turbines um, and there'll be differences all the way through in, in what the animal's actually doing but also in terms of how we think about it because an animal avoiding a turbine inside an array is quite a different thing to avoiding an entire farm slash array. So it might be worth coming up with another word. Maybe maybe the near field avoidance and the far field avoidance are talking about avoiding whole turbines and the evasion is a sort of special term for, for discussing or thinking about what's going on at the very last second. Yep. Um, so can we if we if we're all happy with evasion, can we come back to evasion um, and think about how that's that's defined in terms of coming back to Bob's idea about sort of body lengths. Is it purely just an animal being physically on a trajectory with a with a turbine blade, or is there anything outside of the turb sort of slightly outside of that that you would still consider? You know, what's what's the, the margin of error there? Um, and I'm thinking in particular in terms of how we we actually go out and measure that in the field. Given the limitations of the of the devices that we have to to measure fine scale behaviour, um, and are we actually going to be able to measure it that clearly? I.e., do we have the resolution and the monitoring to determine whether an animal would have um, resulted in, an, an animal's trajectory would have resulted in a, in a collision um, if that animal hadn't taken some sort of recordable response? Do you think that's something we're in a position to do? Um, right now in the field. Could I just make a point trying to clarify that? 
Um, I think it's very difficult to establish whether an animal actually was on course to have a collision because yeah. animals are often adjusting their course and making small turns as they go. So it would be very difficult to establish whether an animal actually was on a course to um, collide with a blade. But what we would be looking for is a response from the animal that results in a, a change in swimming speed to a very high speed and a, and a very sharp turn, essentially looking for an escape response or a startle response, whatever you want to call it. Okay, that's, so that's, that's interesting. So in order to, to parameterize an, 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 a rate of evasion to feed back into predictions, um, what, we're looking, what you suggest we're looking for in the field is a, is a very overt response that's going to be within the resolution of, of the monitoring that, that we have to, that we can, we can go and deploy right now. Can you describe what that monitoring is for us? Okay. Um, I, I guess I'm thinking the, the, the kinds of technologies that I'm familiar with are things like um, active sonar, so multi-beam sonar for, for marine mammals that don't work in, in a 3D sense, but um, you can get a, t a 2D representation of the animal's track. Um, and so I'm immediately thinking about how we can differentiate an evasion response from an animal um, whose path in the, in the water column is either, you know, it's not at the level of the, the turbine, but is taking it below or above. Um, and if that, to, if that was our only monitoring that was in place, we would, we would um, potentially, we would call that a trajectory that had, that, that, with the animal being at risk. Um, there are other other types of technologies that we've been looking at, so using um, arrays of, of hydrophones to, to get 3D localization and tracking of, of echolocating small cetaceans, in which you would get a third dimension, you would get some depth resolution. And depending on the, the, the click rate of the animal and the, the location accuracy of, of your array, you could potentially track animals in 3D coming through a device or an array of devices. But until we actually have some data from a system like that, I think the resolution, there still remains a question of the re resolution at which we're going to be able to determine these animal responses. Um, uh, that, that's very helpful. And it was sort of apropos of the, the comment about the rapid change in movement. Because again, one of the things, and, and it gets back to the avoidance question as well, because I, I actually don't really think avoidance is different from attraction. It's, it's, a, it's a matter yeah. of vector you know, it, it's, you can think of this all as the same behavior, just with different values associated with it. Um, and then the point being that one of the concerns that I frankly have for a lot of these structures is their ability to concentrate prey. And so if we're talking marine mammals or pinnipeds, something that's going to be actively pursuing prey in the vicinity of these uh, structures. And this is one of the things we're going to be concerned about is, is sort of that attraction thing. At, at least that's what I anticipate is that we're going to see these things being attracted to them and, and put in harm's way. Uh, yeah. And so you want to be able to differentiate feeding behavior from a strike event or a strike avoidance event. And that might be very difficult. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and I think part of the, the problem we have is that we're thinking about what we might be measuring and might be monitoring and might need to feed into to the next round of, of decision making um, when we've We've got very little idea of what these data are actually going to look like, um, not least the, the sort of resolution, but also what the, what the noise around a tidal turbine is going to look like in terms of um, being able to detect um, animals on a sonar and also being able to, okay. to localise and, and, tra and track marine mammals reliably. Um, it, may I suggest that it might be possible to distinguish feeding from escape? that the two should be rather different in their characteristics and certainly it'd be possible to do that to distinguish between the two with fish but i don't know about any marine mammal species i think one thing that it's important to start thinking about as well as the likely pattern i'm not too sure about the tidal turbines but certainly the one of the big issues we find found with um, wind turbines is the birds just don't fly close enough to them to get a really detailed picture of this sort of evasion response. Um, 
So, it, it, so how you how you collect enough data to confidently quantify that? Yeah, that that is a, a bit of an issue. Um, and again, I think that's from some of the, the predict the modelling work we've done looking at the sites. We're going to be deploying turbines in. That is a, that is a concern that the areas. It's, it's a bit of a catch-22 that the areas that have been consented and permitted are kind of are, are being permitted because they're pre low predicted encounter rates, which then gives us an issue that we've got we're going to have a low a low power, um, and so then the, the the wish to get to feed these data back into into the the predictive sense is you know it is is perhaps kind of unrealistic. Um, I don't know whether um, Kate Kate was on the line earlier. Kate Brutes Marine Scotland. She obviously isn't. I was hoping to maybe get a, get some perspective um, from Kate in terms of the the consenting and how we we get from a sort of uncertain power sample size data collection to to feeding into the, to the decision making process. But she's not there. Just, just. Uh, one, one thought here from Ben. Um, if we're going to, if we're going to um, encapsulate invasion, the, an escape response associated at presumably close range, um, how would you think about? I was just thinking about a skier going down a slalom course, kind of slaloming between the poles, and, and if they if they got it right, they would they would slalom subtly around a pole and not actually touch it, i.e., not strike it. Um, and so in that respect, an animal moving through an area and then adjusting its, because, because the water's flowing around the turbine blade and the turbine blade's moving itself. If it subtly changes its behavior and doesn't make the strike, then that, under our definition that we've agreed so far, that wouldn't be uh, an evasion event, um, if, if that's right. And then kind of moving on to that from there is, is I think for me, the the thing to quantify would be whether we're calling it evasion or avoidance in the near field. It's the difference between the predicted number of strikes versus the number of animals that are moving through what we consider harm's way if we were measuring it through a sonar or something. So we'd have so many passes and then we would model and work out what we'd expect and then our, our rate would be something less than or more than uh, what we would predict. So, so firstly, was was uh, are we still holding on our holding with our idea that an evasion response is some overt behavior, escape response to demonstrated by the animal, different from a kind of subtle change in, in trajectory as it moves through the sweep, which would be a lot harder. And the way we get onto that is by modeling the difference between or measuring the difference between what we see and what we've worked out through modeling. <laughs> I would kind of respond to the first point in that I, I don't actually, I'm not necessarily sure I believe that it will always be a really overt detectable response. Um, and there might be more subtle movements that, um, that will be within the resolution of the monitoring to, to, de to detect. Um, but I agree that the, com com the comparison between the sort of predicted encounters versus the the empirical encounters can be useful in parameterizing avoidance at a sort of wider scale because you're you're looking at how many animals are, are coming in within a sort of encounter field um, versus what you predicted in the first place, not notwithstanding evasion or evasive responses at all. But I think the issue with that is is the, the certainty around your prediction of encounters in the first place. Um, and whether the difference is going to be within your confidence limits of your prediction. Does, do you know what I mean by that? Yes, Bob, I do understand what you mean by that, yes. Okay. The, uh, difficulty behind that. Um, one further problem is that the actual number of encounters that you may predict for any one species is not that many, not that high over a year. So you're not going to get lots every day from which you might be able to observe evasion responses. Yeah. So you need to observe for a very long time in order to get any responses that you can quantify, measure and analyse. Yeah. 
So I'm kind so of maybe what we really need to do. It, it may not be practical, of course, but to follow what happened in in fish behaviour research, where many years ago we looked at all the details of a fish escape response to predators, understanding what what stimuli evoked them and their performance while swim in in escaping and the direction the of the trajectories, the distribution of trajectories over which they would respond, which I was able to use at a conference um, to write a conference paper on fish evasion to turbines. But we don't have all the same information for marine mammals, but perhaps some of it could be gathered experimentally so that we would have some idea of what their capabilities were. Yeah. And in parallel, we're assessing the, the capabilities of the monitoring technologies to actually detect those yeah. those responses. And I think that's that's going to be quite important. Um, and it's something that we should probably be um, taking into account when we're assessing a range of, or a suite of technologies to do monitoring. Um, and when we're thinking about how we're going to be feeding those into predictive models that we're aware of what we can and can't do and what the limitations are. I think I'm, I'm, I'm just a little bit worried that a lot of reliance is being placed on, on these first few devices that are going to be deployed in the water and we're going to monitor them and we're going to actually learn about these near field um, evasion and, and, and avoidance responses. And I think I'm worried that we're not going to have the desired resolution or the power um, to be able to do that. And I'm just kind of thinking of what we can do now um, to, to, to make that a better situation before we actually start going, spending many hundreds of thousands of pounds, millions deploying them in, and being disappointed in, in the, the long run with what we're actually learning. Um, is that overly pessimistic? So Ted here again. I actually this is this is starting to make some sense to me though from what you're describing between the monitoring and the current state of things, um, which is that it really sounds like it is you know you're, you're well positioned to start with a modeling exercise, and because that should help answer those questions you were just asking about the scale and the reliability of the monitoring, whether you can even do you know whether, whether you can really tell. But I guess what I was thinking was maybe rather than we spend a lot of time talking about evasion and avoidance, but maybe the question is simply, do they intersect the swept area? I mean, if, if we could build models that, based on available you know, data on marine mammal movements, and there's quite a bit of that available now, so if you, if you could use those data to seed a model, um, and, and then as, and you can assign different values for attraction, avoidance, and so forth to give them different levels of risk as they go through. And you can begin to see simply how often do they intersect the swept area of the blade. And never mind, the, you know, for now, think in two dimensions, for starters. Um, and then you can become more refined and think about three dimensions if, in fact, you find that, yeah, hey, this does happen, therefore we need 3D resolution to tell. Or if you find out that it's just not going to happen or if it's going to be so extremely rare that you're never going to be able to, to reliably predict the magnitude of the effect because it's going to be so slight, well, maybe that's as far as you can go. So it gets simpler. Yeah. Well, all here again. And that's exactly what we have done um, for a number of proposed developments. Um, to do exactly as Ted has suggested. Yeah, I think I think my concern more is that with the, the as we scale up in the next wave, in that there's a lot riding on the first phase of some projects to do this learning um, in the field before decisions are made on say the next 50, the next 100 turbines going in going in at a particular site. Um, and we yes, we've done the modelling, and I think that we know that the encounter rates are going to be low. Um, we, we know that there are limitations to the monitoring technology. Um, so I guess I'm kind of asking myself, is it re are we really going to be able to get a handle on this with the current the current status of, of monitoring? And uh, sorry, I'm not I'm, I'm I am sounding quite pessimistic. Now, because what I want you to do <laughs> is, this is the scientist, not the environmentalist speaking, is I want you to put some of these somewhere that's actually dangerous. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I have so. <laughs> discussions in the UK about that. Right, get some data. And it's um, I, if you're running this as an experiment, I think that the uh, Home Office wouldn't be too pleased that you actually <laughs> were hoping to have more interactions and collisions with animals. Yeah. 
But if there were a place where there were a, a population that was not, that was doing very, very well, um, and there was a sort of acceptable amount of risk, but the, the chance of encounter was high, um, then we could... have a more welfare issue here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we, we give licenses to, to shoot seals in this country. Um, um, so so um, it's not, yeah, it's not completely un, unreasonable. And, and it's pinnipeds we're talking about. Is that the, the primary concern here, not toothed whales? In the places that are kind of earmarked for most development at the moment, it is, it's um, harbour seal populations that are the biggest issue in the UK. Um, and particularly around Orkney and the Pentland Firth waters where a lot of the, the, the development is, is slated to take place. There are other parts around the UK that are more likely to, to potentially impact on, on small, small cetaceans. Um, but the harbour purpose population in the UK is not, um, is not a concern. It's, it's stable and large. And there isn't the same concern about it, despite the quite high level of environmental protection. Um, there is a, a sort of larger allowable take under the, the current consenting regime. Salmon are also uh, uh, an important issue in the Pentland Firth. Yeah, that's right. So, so to what extent have the, the kind of issues we've been discussing um, about marine mammals also applied to, to fish um, well, in terms I think, of... I, th I think they apply quite a lot. Um, Clearly, one one needs some sort of uh, model uh, populated with, uh, even if there's lots of uncertainty, populated with information that's available just now, and progressively refine this as better information comes in. And uh, that's what we've tried to do in the case of uh, 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 producing some figures uh, for, for the Pentland Firth and turbine arrays there. Uh, we've uh, we tried to build on some earlier modelling that was done by a consultant Exodus, and we've reparameterized it a bit, and we, we hope to improve that as more information comes in. Um, yeah. So, how much have you have you looked at the, the sort of power questions on your sort of ability to to refine that as as more information comes in and more data is collected? I think the power is currently quite low. Uh -huh. uh, May I say one of the problems that's being overlooked when it comes down to animals of the size of fish, particularly smaller fish, is really what you might call the inertia effect of does an object actually punch through the boundary layer and, and strike the blade as passing, or will it be swept aside in the stream of the, the flow stream? which will depend upon the, on scale, that is both on the relative speed of the blade against the water and the animal through the water, and also the size of the, of the animal as an object, the mass of the animal. And that is, I've asked that question of engineers, and they aren't able to give me an answer. So can give what you hydrodynamic time. scale um, animals, below which animals would be swept aside and not hit, and above which they would go through and hit the blade. There's a report from Alden Labs that does, I think, quantify that, but um, it's rare. Yeah, they can give you partial information, but uh, more information would be useful, and there's ballpark figures for the, for the size of fish that might be likely to, to, to slipstream as opposed to collide, and uh, there's in-between stages as well. Yeah, more information will be very useful in all of that. But what, we, what I'm pointing at is we really need a, a simple model, a predictive model that would tell us what would happen there. Um, yes, there's information on different sizes of fish passing through turbines, hydrokinetic turbines as well, and whether they might actually be hit and damaged. But we don't know. It's just that they, we, we need to know the principles that are underlying that so that we can understand it rather than some empirical data. Okay, I'm just, I'm just keeping an eye on time, and that's actually that's got got us around to five o'clock. Um, so I don't know whether people want to feel that they've they've had enough, they've heard enough, um, and we can we can convene another day, um, or whether people still got got burning questions or burning things they want to discuss. I mean, I well, I was kind of maybe keen to ask um, people that have experience of monitoring fish in in um, other 
types of, of, of turbines, um, the, the success or, or, or otherwise they've been able to detect interactions, um, evasion and, and further afield avoidance and whether there's any experience there that might be able to, to guide us in the UK when we're, we're going to deploy some devices fairly soon. So this is Gail Zablewski at UMaine. I don't know how far you want to get into this since we are running late, but um, you know we've done some work with a multi-beam sonar um, close up to a device and mostly looking at fish behavior uh, within five meters of um, a turbine. And I guess in listening to all of this discussion, the fine line and kind of what Bob was just talking about in terms of encounter and strike is, is really difficult to define even with the multi-beam sonar that we use. Um, so I think coming back to some of the strike encounter um, models as well as thinking about the physics that Bob mentioned will be important. Um, how that will help you, one of the big things that we've been moving to now is moving away from the single device further and further. Everyone initially thought a lot of it um, problems that occur right at the blades, and we've been actually trying to step back and um, think about different spatial dimensions. When do you see avoidance? And base that on different um, animal size. Um, so I don't know how much you want to get into that, and I know that um, some others there in Washington are working on using different um, different monitoring devices to look over a further field that might be useful for your purposes as well. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll probably pick up pick up on those um, side of this discussion. Thanks very much. Um, I'd really be interested in, in having a, a further discussion there. Um, I think time-wise, we're probably at the end of today's session. Um, I'll give anyone the chance to, to have a, to, to make some final comments. I know I found it very interesting. Scott, you were coming to this She's commenting that she's seen some open hydro video and she can see fish behavior. The videos, video is an interesting one. Video would be great if we could guarantee um, visibility um, and the, the range as well potentially is quite limited. I mean, some of the underwater environments that, that I've seen footage, turbine mounted video cameras. Um, and it's certainly going to be part of the suite of monitoring techniques we're going to be using. Um, but it's never going to be on its own 